Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga of the New York Times, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first ever New York Times Food Festival. This is a food festival as big and exciting as the city that inspired it. All this weekend, there's the park, food tastings, live cooking demonstrations, and more just down the block in Bryant Park. Then there are the nights, seven evenings of exclusive dinners at 10 of New York's, of New York Times food critic Pete Wells' favorite New York City restaurants. And here in the Times Center, there are the talks, a series of discussions with the most interesting and vital voices in today's food scene. Following today's talk, we invite you to enjoy a free cup of coffee from Joe in the lobby and visit our festival lounge downstairs in the hall. There you can grab a drink at the festival bar, watch the other talks as they're streamed live, visit the Kitchen Arts and Letters pop-up bookshop for author signings and books by our featured chefs and New York Times journalists, enjoy a free scoop of the flavor of record, the ice cream flavor created by the Times in collaboration with Ample Hills Creamery, and much more. I'd like to give special thanks to the sponsors of the New York Times Food Festival, our presenting sponsor, MasterCard. Our major sponsor, Uber Eats. Our event sponsors, Diageo, Sub-Zero Wolf, and Cove. Our supporting sponsors, AARP New York City, Badia Spices, Deloitte, and Resi. And our contributing sponsors, Joe Coffee Company and REI. And now on to our program. This afternoon's talk between Sam Cass and Alex Wagner will not only help you navigate Thanksgiving dinner better, the couple's story will also show you how inextricably food and politics have become in today's culture. Now please join me in welcoming Alex and Sam to this Time Center stage, along with the New York Times' big city columnist, Ginia Belafonte. Um, thank you guys for thank coming. You. Enjoy thank us. you for having us. How's it going? I'm really excited to talk to you. You guys good? <laughs> good. Happy to be here. So, you know, there used to be this ridiculous adage that seems so benighted and silly now you never talk about politics or religion. Right. Right. And that's just like now, because all we want to do is talk about politics. Exactly. It's like an addiction. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, everything is at kind of DEF CON 1, and we are like, <laughs> feeling things so intensely, right. and the world is ending on Thursday, yeah. and, or Wednesday, or Wednesday. and uh, so everybody, even though, especially in cities, I'm sure you guys like me, when you socialize, everybody's, so, everybody's um, kind of like ideologically siloed, but in cities you still get the sense that people basically you know, share the same opinions. Mm -hmm. On the same, at the, on the other hand though, you know, now especially you can get a lot of different, a lot of degrees of difference between centrists and progressives, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so uh, I actually was at a dinner party where someone got so angry and animated about the charter school issue. I thought the woman might, you know, a friend of mine I thought was going to take the raspberry coulis and throw it at the hedge fund guy uh, who wanted to eviscerate the teachers union. So anyway, my point is, <laughs> um, what you know, when you guys host. What are your guidelines? Uh, do you try to navigate the conversation? Do you, you know, you manage the? Do you point? manage? <laughs> I think we okay. So generally speaking, I'm not going to put forth our dinner parties as the most ideologically um, varied yeah, that's table fair. settings. I mean, yeah, we we have. I mean, we seek out <laughs> interesting people, but I don't think we have at our dinner table at least a lot of people from the for example, far right end of the right. spectrum, just by virtue of what we do for a living and where we live. Right. Um, but, you know, as you point out, there is, you know, there are hardcore progressives and there are more centrists, and especially in the, the season of the 2020 election, there are kind of like pragmatists and idealists, right? Exactly. And especially yeah. as it concerns a democratic field, the like, this is where we should go as a people, as, a, as believers, and this is where we should go if we want to win, right? Um, right? I think generally, and we have people like that in our own families, I would say, as well. But we don't have any rules at our, we don't, so here's the thing, most of the people we have over are just like our friends from outside of our professional worlds. Sure. So most of the time they're basically just like, please tell us what's gonna happen. 
Yeah, there's just, a lot. And you're like, please. Like, right. And it was like, well, our guess is as good as, you know, but they're just, there's everybody so desperate right. to know how this is going to play out and how the story ends and just want to know that it's going to be okay. Right. Uh, but there have been, I mean, I will say there are moments where you see someone, like the steam starts coming out of the totally, ears. yes. And I think as it pertains to a wider audience thinking about how to have dinner parties where you can talk about politics, you have to think of yourself a little bit as a referee. I mean, I think yeah. that there, we all yeah. have our, our ideas about um, where we, we should go politically and who we should be nominating and so forth. But if you're hosting, I think it's, par it's, it's, it's incumbent upon you to make sure that nobody stabs someone with a butter knife. That should be rule and, one. Nobody stabs someone like, with a butter knife. Yeah. Sam, Sam's like, or not. Maybe or that's not. more like, interesting. Yeah. Uh, we just moved into an apartment on the Upper West Side, and uh, the family that lived there, the father was one of the founders of the Paris Review, and oh. he had dinner parties all the time. So people and were, Norman Mailer was right. there all the time. Stabbing and, somebody with a bread and, knife, not a butter wife knife. wife stabbed Norman Mailer in the neck Adele. in our dining room. Right. Right. So, so you all are welcome to dinner. <laughs> so if, if it's might someone not make it awesome, <laughs> who's, like, it might make a great story for later, let the stabbing commence. Right. But for everybody else who's not Norman Mailer or in that you know, tier of guests, <laughs> I say monitor the conversation and like, you know, find your, you have to be the reverie. You have to find a conversational whistle to get people well, out of the box. Certainly back then people were more comfortable with contention because yes. now everybody's so fired up, but there's this veneer of, yes. right? So Alex, tell me some field stories from the field. I know you have gotten worked up yourself at some dinner parties. Yes, so tell I have. me it's how bad it's gotten for well, you. Well, I'm, you know, I pride myself on, as someone who is like, you know, has hosted um, the news <laughs> and news programs. I think of myself as someone who has an ability to not let emotion get in the way of your objective. Civil, exactly, and <laughs> just basic, basic civility. Anything. Yeah, right. My yeah. husband's like, see her at home. Staying quiet. I think that's all like thrown out the window after a few glasses of wine when I'm like the guest at someone else's house, and we happen to be at the at a dinner party. Uh, I'm not going to na name names whose house it was. We but, can ply you with some alcohol right here. Yeah, and, and exactly. Get some names this town, everybody thinks New York City is like the sort of swamp pit of like Bolshevik liberalism, <laughs> but like Donald Trump is from here and right, there's still right. a lot of rich people who support Donald Trump in this town. Right. And we were at the house of people who are very wealthy, not necessarily Trump supporters, but not Trump supporters. There, there, it, there is some, I, I would say there are through lines on certain issues and a robust animated conversation unfolded about education and teachers' unions. And, okay. I, and I will say, Sam comes from a family of teachers. Right. It was one of those dinner parties where it was a salon-style party, and each table had like you know a curated group of guests, and then the, the host and the hostess were asking us all questions. That and feels, doesn't would, that feel like a little too much pressure? Should you just be able to like drink your sunset? Yes. Too and I, much work. It was too much work. It was too much work, and I think I was pissed off that I was being put in that position. Yes. And Correct. so when it came to this, this conversation starts about teachers' unions. And we find ourselves as kind of like the only, I mean, I don't know. We felt like somehow Sam and I became the like, representatives of, of Bolshevik liberalism from right. New York. And Sam got really angry. I got pissed, yeah. Yeah, Sam got really angry. What does Sam like, angry look like? <laughs> oh, my God. It's not pleasant. It's, it's a real thing. And like it, I could tell he was kind of white-knuckling his way through it. And, and, and I think the whole situation I found so repulsive that it was like 10 o'clock at night by the time, it was like a Tuesday night at 10 o'clock, maybe it was a Saturday night, it was a weekend at 10 p.m. I like got up in the, like the middle of the conversation, I was like, I've gotta get on a conference call, we've gotta leave right now. And everyone was like, Confer conference call? At like 10 o'clock at night on Saturday? And you're like, it's in Beijing, I, I gotta like, go. It is, this she is just, yeah. And then she just I left. Like, I just walked out. And neither he left my him, friend, he left Yes, him? and neither of my friends. Hell? Oh boy. It was, just, I'll take ownership, <laughs> partial ownership. And so then she's like, is everything okay? And I was like, oh yeah, it's just a little work. <laughs> It was terrible. It was an example of what not to do. It was a great. And uh, both in terms of the structure of the dinner party and in terms of the wine consumption and storming out. And we right. have literally not seen those people right. again. Shockingly, you know, they didn't <laughs> invite you back. I, I wonder why. Can you just expand a little on the, is, is, you know, are people better schooled at having these kind of conversations in Washington? Because it is a place where you, you know, in the K. Graham days and the salon days, people did mm -hmm. uh, sit next to people with opposing opinions. Sam? Uh, well, I can't speak for what it's like now. I can right, speak right. for what it was like 
three years ago. Okay. Uh, and let's it time travel like back to then. <laughs> it, it feels unrecognizable in many ways, in a way that's actually really hard for my brain to, it, it just like cognitive dissonance. Um, I, I feel like there's, um, you're, you're definitely just in, a, in an environment where everybody is very serious about the issues of the day, mm -hmm. very knowledgeable, some more than others, but like everybody at least you know, puts work in and, and it stays on top of the issues. And I'd say the level of conversation is much higher, although than I found in New York or in other places, quite honestly, in, on politics and issues. Yeah, because everybody's there because they're working on this in some way, shape, or form. Right. Or it's a very unique culture. I mean, Washington, for, Washington gets a ton of you know, a bad rap for many good reasons, but most of the people are there because they genuinely are trying to make the world a better place. Right. Now, you probably disagree with 90% of their, their vision of whatever that is, but they're there with the intention of trying to move the nation and the world in a, in a direction that they truly believe in. Um, and that's a quite a unique thing right. uh, for there. The, the, the contrived conversation is out of control in Washington, though. So, like, because of Graham's legacy, it sort of feels like there's a lot of people there who sort of feel like think it's their their turn to carry on that legacy. Oh, that's sure, sure. So those like right. those like organized dinners where you have a bunch of high name journalists and policymakers, and you, everybody gets called on to like pontificate on whatever the question of the dinner is, gets really tiresome. I'm uh, sure. And they're just I'm not sure. that fun. Uh, <laughs> But, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, people take that stuff very seriously there. And you do come across, you know, a wider spectrum of views than I say I, I do here. I, I will just say, as someone who grew up in Washington oh. and whose father was involved in politics, it's always kind of the bread and butter of any Washington dinner party is politics. Right? Sure. You're not going to get in and out of it without it. Until the Trump administration, I really, and as someone that lived in Washington for a long time and did some reporting from there for a little while, there was much more cross-pollination between yeah. Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. now. In part, that's because a lot of those Republicans had served yeah. in other administrations. They sort of, there was more, there was just more exchange of ideas between Republicans and Democrats, and you right. had people who'd been in Washington for a long time, and yes, certain administrations bring new people in, but there was just a kind of an underclass of like, civil servants and people that were interested in government that existed through the decades. So much of the Trump administration is made up of people who've never held office before right. yeah. or are coming from different places and we are in and, and the conversation around the Trump administration is so divisive that my I, I do have some friends that are working in that White House. They they hang out with each other. They there's a feeling that they are in the foxhole and they are exhausted by the social interaction right. and de defending someone that I think a lot of, of people on the outside feel is indefensible. Um, and so I, I think from the outside, and this is just a layman's perspective, there's much less commingling in a social setting than there, there, there were be. or has been. I right. think. Yeah, but I actually think uh, that started breaking down before now. Like, there's you know, lots of people talk about the breakdown of Washington and, and the, that culture, but it certainly happened in Obama. I mean, the, 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 the reaction to us was intense. And there was much less, there was still some, and I definitely would say more than now, but there wasn't what there used to be. Uh, and like, by the way, just to talk about dinner parties, like, you know, there are times where the President of the United States invited Republicans over for dinner parties, and they wouldn't come, which has never happened in the history of our country, ever. Um, and it's interesting that just now as I'm up here thinking about it, a lot of those interactions would happen over meals. Right, yeah. Where like Republicans and Democrats would go yeah. get dinner. There'd be formal dinners or informal dinners, but a lot of like where, like during the day, there'd be the sort of the typical battles, and then at night, mm -hmm. people would break bread right. and actually do a lot Have of the drinks. real work and the building of relationships that actually is what moved the needle. And you could feel that breaking down when we were there, for sure. Uh, and now I think it's totally broken. broken. Totally broken. Yeah. Um, I want to move for uh, for a minute to the the family table setting. I think uh, you know in the '60s there was this big generational divide, and you know young people, you know, were really in this antagonistic relationship with parents over Vietnam, over over so many things, right? And now I think there's more generational similarity. Um, but of course, holidays bring us with ex to extended families. Where there's <laughs> often the, those dinners can be totally bonkers, um, and Uncle Bob, you know, can be some kind of like uh, black helicopter, <laughs> no government freak. And so you grew up in a family like that, where there at the extreme, at, there were some extreme uh, 
opposition yeah. going on. Tell me about that, tell those stories, and then tell me what your takeaway was from that, what you learned from growing up that way. So yeah, so my, um, my dad is a socialist for all intents and purposes, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, was a labor guy, like gave up his career to go organize labor in auto factories. He worked in, at Ford to try to build the union wow. there. Like, so he was like really all in. Uh, and my uncle, his brother, uh, is uh, a staunch neocon conservative, worked in the Bush administration. He's, he's a bioethicist, so he's, he's brilliant and, wonder, and wonderful, but v- could not be more different. Uh, and so like Thanksgiving, we'd always have Thanksgiving at, there, at my uncle's house. And <laughs> it would be like lovely and you know, talking about life and what's going on and blah, 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 and very festive. And then like the pie would come out and it was like the lines were drawn and it was just <laughs> on. And actually like one of my, one of my earliest memories of my, like, my dad being proud, I think I was about seven, seven or eight. And there was some big debate about Reagan and all this stuff. And I, was, and I chimed in, well, what about Iran-Contra? <laughs> and my dad like beamed at me. And then, and, then, and, then, uh, and then afterwards, he was like, I'm so proud of you, son. That was, <laughs> that was an excellent point. <laughs> and so, you know, we would just, I mean, it, you know, sometimes it would get very intense, certainly like into the Bush administration and into the Iraq war. Like, I mean, it got like very heated. Yeah. And, you know, in some ways started breaking down a bit, in, which mirrored. Those were very, the, yeah, people forget those Reagan years. I would argue with someone who still attends those Thanksgivings, it's still pretty contentious. No, yeah, no, it's always contentious. You can, you'll get to your first Thanksgiving at, our, at my family's house. And, <laughs> uh, but I would say, um, I think what's sort of different or it was always from shared values, right? Those fights were always like I think my dad and my uh, and and my uncle like their core values are basically the same. They just have wildly different interpretations of how to express them and how to achieve them in a democracy in a society. Um, but you, we always sort of like hung together because both sides of the table. Uh, and it broke down pretty clearly, except for my cousin was oftentimes would flip to us. Uh, um, but you know, um, you know, still were, were, were serious people mm-hmm. who cared about these issues passionately, were living their lives to try to uh, live those values, and just would have healthy, real debates around, you know, what how the country should be and what's the ideal that we should be working towards. Um, and so that hung together, I think that shared values is what's starting to break down in our country. And that's why these conversations break down because it feels like uh, we no longer are sharing some of these core values of who we understand ourselves to be. And once that's lost, these conversations, uh, you know, become, end, yeah, yeah they, they, well, they either end or they go nowhere. I mean, right. they're not, <clears throat> not even really conversations. They're sort right. of yelling matches that then stop. Right. Um, and I think that's what starts to get quite concerning. Tell us about that first Thanksgiving, Alex. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I mean, listen, I grew up, and my mom and dad would fight about world affairs all the time, so I'm, uh, I'm a big... You're person. seasoned. I'm seasoned. <laughs> I like, as Sam can tell you, I love a good argument, but I had yes. never, been to, a, I had <laughs> I never been to a Thanksgiving where there was a reading, and like, we got there and sat down, and there was a printout of think, George Washington's Thanksgiving Day Proclamation. <laughs> there are professors at the University of Chicago. Okay, so, okay. I mean, required reading. We sit down, and I'm like, God, there is not nearly enough alcohol, or I haven't consumed enough alcohol to get into this. <laughs> and it starts out, I mean, it's just, like, in the, in the context of this big debate we're having over identity and race, yeah. to go into, you know, Thanksgiving, which is kind of the locus for this big conversation around the, the native people, yeah. you know, like who belongs here. But the, the, I think it was your uncle who set it down, and he was like, this is a great um, statement around national values. And then one wing of the table was like, oh, no, wait a second here. 
This is about us versus them. This is about who belongs here. This is the beginning of the genocide, truly, or the wiping away of- You can of, know who said that, that's my dad. Anyway. Somehow, <laughs> then it gets, I, just, I believe it ended somehow with like police brutality, Laquan McDonald, Whoa. a cousin crying, and like me still like getting ever more sober as the conversation like went on. And I, I, I do believe that we skipped the next year, Thanksgiving. You yeah. You by, <laughs> what do you mean you skipped? We, we by, you with, by we. Skipped. I was like maybe. Maybe we're not going. Maybe our place for yeah. Thanksgiving. Right. There have been no readings since, and so everyone is still talking to each other. And I think okay. that I will just say, I think it's important. I mean, I think you have to think about conversations about politics at the dinner table like exercise. It is about using that muscle, and it does get easier. And I think that it is in these moments of passionate debate and, and feelings of rejection from people who don't agree with you, it is all the more reason to try and continue the conversation. You're not gonna convince anybody over one meal. But if you keep going back at it and you keep trying to build empathy and you keep trying to make a reason case, I do feel like somehow it gets, it gets into the back of people's minds begins to, doesn't necessarily change the brain circuitry, but to be confronted over a meal in an intimate surrounding with someone who doesn't think of the world the same way that you do is not a bad thing. I think it's right. actually a good and important exercise for all so of us. So it will have, I mean, you're never going to change someone's opinion who's very committed to that well, opinion. But right? you can soft, you can at least try and get at the edges of it. And I think, yeah. like, if that's the best we can do, then that's the best we can do. But I don't think that, you know, Hostility is not a reason to give up. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's something that you said that uh, uh, around trying to convince, you know, it's worthy to try to convince the whoever you're talking to, and I, which is all I've ever tried to do. Uh, and I think that's part of the problem with our just discourse in general, and certainly over dinner time. Because your expectation is so high, you're like, I'm gonna. Turn yeah, but this person uh, around. well, it's also just um, discourse should be about trying to understand better. Right. And when we set out in these times, like there's, we're so pitched against each other in so many ways on so many issues that we set out. And th so you just reminded me of my outlook <laughs> in these things. You're right? welcome, honey. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, love. Uh, but it's that, like, but we go to these conversations trying to convince the other side that they're wrong. Uh, oh, yes, right. And that That's we're right. right. Yeah. Um, and when both sides come to the conversation like that, the, the chances are we're not going to get very far. Um, and I think when you actually try to, one, under, try to understand like what's actually happening here, not, not just in like some like stupid, fluffy, like I just wanna understand where you're coming from. I mean, like right. really understand what's happening in our country, why does this person think what they're thinking? And by the way, like a lot of times people don't really understand what they think, right? right. And, and, and I'd say that for myself, like the implications of your position would lead to these sort of things, have you thought about that? Right, so I just think like we have to get better at these kind of conversations and work harder at, at trying to just deepen our understanding of the world and the people that we're with and their positions and our positions. That's where this starts to actually make progress, I think, on both sides. But when we start, which, is, which I found, and honestly, my uncle taught me this, he, in most of these arguments, wouldn't really even say anything. He would just ask questions about your position until it completely fell apart. <laughs> he was like a debate coach. Yeah, he just was like, okay, well, so if you think that, why do you think that? And then three steps on the line, and you're just like, shit, I don't know, oops, sorry, I don't know what I think. <laughs> and, and so um, it's, very, it's very hard to do that. You have to be very disciplined, because you get upset, somebody says something crazy, and you know, you know, it sort of gets under your skin, and then things start spinning off. But that, so I think if we reframed why we're having a conversation at dinner around these issues, and what success really looks like, we could maybe get a little further than we are now. Totally. Okay, I want to talk about um, you know the politics are so explosive right now, and there's often so much we feel like we can't say in front of children because it's terrifying. <laughs> the world ending is terrifying, <laughs> and um, you know you don't want to quote the president's tweets at dinner. At, uh, but what um, do you guys? You know you're young parents. Yeah. Um, and uh, what, you know, what do you think, how should we be talking about politics with kids at the family table every night? I mean, honestly, like the most terrifying thing is climate, which isn't right, necessarily totally. even a political issue, and right. that's really what our kids are gonna have to deal with. That, yes. I worry about that conversation yes. almost more than Donald Trump. Like, yes. He's gonna be some like, I mean, unless he's president forever, 
Always a possibility, but he will be something that is like back in their lizard you brain. Do right? not say that. Yeah. Right. Well, you don't know. <laughs> anyway, I I think I'm a little bit. Did you guys see that movie, Captain Fantastic? No. Okay. Well, it's Anybody? basically Viggo Mortensen raising his children in the woods. Oh yes, like, yes, with yes, like, yes, you know, yes. Kindling for R- fuel. Right. <laughs> and like we're not doing that, obviously. Right. But he's kind of like radical. That's like the Upper West Side, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Radical transparency. <laughs> and I don't, we definitely don't practice radical transparency in our house. But I, I do think you have to, like, I want my children to be engaged in the world. Our right. five-month-old is just like worried about the bottle. So we're not going to be talking to him about um, impeachment. A glass bottle, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's like BPA phthalate-free. Um, but I mean, I, you know, I, I think that there's a way to talk about this moment where you're not framing it in terms of like menace, but like a complicated, difficult time that we're trying to resolve as people who are all part of a family, and the family is the United States of America. I mean, we have to work this out. Right. And the issues that we're talking about are really big existential issues. That's one of the reasons why these conversations are so passionate and so animated, because we're making big decisions about where we go from here as, as far as identity, immigration, race, gender, I mean, like the social safety net, like what kind of social compact do we have in, in America? And I think it's good for children to try and develop their, their ideas about, you know, what, what should we, what is our responsibility? I mean, one of the things that I think is most important as a parent is to make sure my children are A, not assholes, and B, that they're, em- that, that they're empathetic and that they're engaged. And like, I think talking about politics in a way that makes sense to them, you know what I mean? Right. I think you can't get into like fiscal year, you know, third quarter of the fiscal year. <laughs> you want it, but, but to, call, to, to have them a- interested in what's happening in the world. I'm a journalist that focuses on politics. Right. My kid saw me looking at a, a rough cut of the show that I um, co-host that airs tomorrow at 8 p.m. on Showtime. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Donald Trump is having a press conference and he sees me there and he's like, mama, mama, mama yeah. at the press conference. And I think that's good that he sees his mom like out there trying yeah. to be a journalist in these crazy right. times and understands what it is that I'm trying to document. And what's at stake. Yeah. It's funny. Uh, I just had lunch with a good friend who is deputy director uh, at OMB, Office of Managed Budget, and deputy uh, secretary of state. So she's had some really big jobs. She has a seven-year-old, and she has a game that they started with her seven-year-old called Public Policy. <laughs> and, and so basically, but it, it's, so just, uh, she made, the game is basically, there's a problem, like homelessness, what's the policy? And the kid Ow. comes up with, and the kid, but she kind of, she was like, what are you talking about? And they were, she was talking with her husband about some issue that they were trying to resolve, I don't remember what it was and what their solution they thought was going to be. And so now it it's turned into this game where it's wow. like, here's the problem. The kid has to say, well, 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 and they say, well, what would you want to do about that? And it's like fascinating how sophisticated she is. And so the, she was describing some of the answers that she was coming up with that are like, like actually really good policy. So you're saying someone with a seven-year-old brain could be president? Yes, I am. I think the seven-year-old could at least run the MTA. <laughs> yeah. For but sure. I, so I, but here's, here's what I'd say, just, you know, it's part of the current situation that brings me um, as much consternation. Well, it's hard to know what brings the most consternation, but it's part of it that really hits an emotional chord for me because um, being in the White House for six years, so close to them, seeing how the impact and influence just their existence had on kids and the example that was set and just how kids just absorbed that and embodied that. I mean, I, I'm sure everybody's seen that picture with that little boy touching Barack's hair. Yes. Uh. Because he just couldn't believe that somebody with the same hair right. was actually president. And it was just like, that kid's life has changed. And that's for millions of kids, just seeing, uh, uh, seeing him um, being a person of color, all the different parts that he represented, but also carrying himself in the way that he did, like, is as big an impact as any single policy thing that he did. And so, you know, on the flip side, you know, we have the example, politics aside, of what we have in office now, and kids are now looking at that being like, yeah, cursing is totally fine in our public discourse, sexually assaulting women is totally fine, and, uh, you know, like crazy stuff that is very hard to combat. Right. And I think unless, kids are absorbing it whether parents are talking about it or not. 
And so I think in a certain extent, uh, policy stuff aside, it's even more important, and the dinner table is the place to do it. Right. To have that kind of ongoing conversation with our children about you know values and morals and like what what we should be standing for because kids are learning that. Yeah, I will. Without say. being taught, and 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 that's um, I think so. That is even it's now more important than ever. I right. guess I'd say. Our, I just I this this thing happened to our our older son is. Uh, you know, he looks like me a lot. Sam says it looks like he looks like I had a child with myself. And he's it's true. two. And he was at this pizza place out on Long Island where we have a house. And there was a seven year old and a 10 year old. And they wouldn't let him play with them. And he didn't really kind of understand. And then at one point, the seven year old girl said, or I guess the father came over and said, Well, what's your name to my son? And he said, Thai. And the little girl looked at him and said, we're going to call you Brownie. <gasps> and I, I wasn't there. My mom was there, and she relayed the story to me. And I just remember being like, it was like a dagger to my heart. Because, you know, if you had asked me five years ago before I had, I had had children whether such a thing would be possible in right. the year 2019 and whether, like, not only possible, but a child, a seven-year-old, would talk to a two-year-old like that, it was devastating, but it was also a reminder to Sam's point that children are absorbing. Yes. They are like sponges, for better and for worse. And if they are in environments where, you know, racial epithets are thrown, they, they then see the world through those lenses. And, you know, as a matter of, I think, maybe preparedness or trying to process moments like that as he grows older and really kind of internalizes, you have to tell them what's going on in the world so that they can understand that they did nothing wrong and that this is part of a larger problem and that people like that should be pitied and, dis and talked to about right. why they think th that you can do that to other people. Right, right. Um, shifting for a second, I collect old etiquette books and I want to read something Whoa. to you there that you struck go. me. Little known fact. Yeah. The Ladies' Book of Etiquette and Manual of Politeness, 1860. Never, when advancing an opinion at the table, assert positively that the thing is so, but give your opinion as an opinion. And I think people now with social <laughs> media so absorb so much media, absorb so much information that they always feel certain. You know, they always they so often feel certain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't feel that their opinion is an opinion. So I wanted you guys to think about what, how do you think social media, that incivility um, and anger on social media has filtered down to the dining room? I actually think, as someone that has gotten a, a lot of Twitter hate, like those mm -hmm. weird Twitter eggs, like sending me those Twitter ed, egg avatars sending right. me like hate filled like screens. Um, when you meet people in person, they're way less likely to be so abrasive and aggressive. Yeah. And that's another that's reason why you have to have those conversations. You know, I've been to a, a fair number of Trump rallies in the course of my work as a journalist, and people are pretty dug in about, you know, their feelings about this president and the rightness or wrongness of things. But I try and have conversations with them where you kind of pull out from them like to your point, why you know why do you why do you think that? I was with a man two days ago, and I said, "What do you think about the impeachment thing?" He was like, "There is no crime happened here. No mm -hmm. crime happened right. here. He's positive. He's trying to root out corruption." And I said, "You know, with with China having China, you know, you, you just have to keep asking questions to get the root of 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 really the nugget of what people think, which often makes them question why it is that they think that." And and you know, it became clear that you know we don't usually go to China you know, an aggressor when it comes to human rights, and certainly not the most corruption-free country on the world, to be the policeman for our own democratic right. candidates. And right. traditionally, the role of the president of the United States is to protect American citizens as the leader of the country. Right. Rather than tell him all that, we kind of got, we got to it through a question and answer. And I think that if you pose it as a question to the ladies' book of etiquette, <laughs> right, and less a sort of defend your position, but you explore it in a sort of more roundabout way right. that is less confrontational, I, I think that's the beginning to yeah. getting to a more peaceable kingdom. Yeah. But the, from the social media side of it, I mean, I feel like it's sort of like uh, we've taken like road rage. Yeah. People were like, could say the nastiest things to a driver next to them that they would never say otherwise. 
uh, and now we have this vehicle to say that in public. So right. Now it's like we're all road raging on our phones to totally. everybody. So I think it's bringing it out of like the car now into the world. Right. And it's definitely having a pretty, you know, it's it's a, uh, it's not the problem. I think he, I think it actually gets, in some ways, more blame than it than it deserves. Uh, but it's making the problem worse, right? It's exacerbating mm-hmm. some of these underlying cracks and tendencies and anger and feelings out in a way that people feel it's okay to right. uh, say things in, in a way that we, it's just coarsening the discourse and coarsening right. the culture. Um, to extend the car metaphor, <laughs> um, I'm obsessed with distracted dining, which is when you're, you know, you're sitting around a table with your friends and maybe you're arguing about the roots of the glass de act. For yeah, example, as one does, as one does in this season uh, in Brooklyn, and uh, somebody will just like wait a minute. No, I'm getting my phone, and you know, then everybody is on their phone, um, ostensibly for the service of the conversation, but it's pretty annoying. <laughs> so, you, what you guys, I think, have some different opinions yeah, you, about sure do. distracted dining. <laughs> that is not fair. Why don't you tell them how your problem started? <laughs> ah. <laughs> I'm charging extra just, for the couple's just, therapy. Just amongst us. Just amongst us. You just, just, it's a good story. I mean, uh, it's a reasonable story. Thank you. That's so thoughtful. That's so generous of you. Uh, well, I did develop a problem. And uh, in the White House, I had three phones. Whoa. One for the residents, one for policy, and one personal. And at any given time, on any of those phones, the President of the United States might be emailing or calling you. So you have a little flash. Back then, it was back then it was Blackberries, uh, <laughs> and if that light was blinking, you had to look at it, and it was blinking all the time because with all the policy work, it was like the emails were thousands by the day. So I developed a very bad habit of constantly checking my phone, but not be, because I really did actually have to. And now nobody cares about me. I'm so unimportant. But I'm still checking my phone constantly, and it's like the only thing there for me is Instagram. <laughs> so, so, yeah. But I will say two things. One, I don't do that at dinner table. I mostly put my phone away at dinner table. I, she's going to say I don't. I do. <laughs> uh, and two, I just had a breakthrough, though, which I haven't told you about. Uh-oh. Which is that we did a lot on behavioral economics. I can't wait to tell Cass this. We did a lot on behavioral economics in the White House around health. And I put Instagram on the back page. You know, I have like five pages of apps. Oh, whatever. you're it's, tricking yourself. It's, con- it's cut down my you looking at it, it for like too, you know. 75% reduction. I think that's pretty good. No, it is. I mean, the addiction is a real thing. It is very hard to get people, once one person has broken the seal and pulled pull their phone out, yeah, it's that's really true. hard. It's really everybody does. I would love to institute a no phone policy at our dinner table, which we, I mean, we try to do it. We de- um, like, I, I am, you know, in the news and journalism and I have to be with my phone, but you know, you have to draw boundaries. Yeah. You have to, especially with children who watch you right. do this. You know, it kills me that the, our son is constantly trying, yeah, to, trying get to get our, our phones. Phone. And yeah, it's, it's crazy. terrible. They're Even bad. the five month old sees the phone and he's just like, we, we try and keep right? them away yeah. from screens, but like, right. you know, how can you? Yeah. Right. right. I think this is one of those things where it's like, and I every, would be pretty every, absolute about this. It is a bad thing. Keep them, don't even keep them near your dinner. T- put them in your bedroom so you can't even get it. And like, have dinner. Look people in the eye. Talk to each other. And by the way, also, try walking down the street, put your phone in your pocket, and look up. Nobody looks up no. anymore. All right. <laughs> wow. It was, when I graduated from college, I had this crazy theater professor who said, all of you all will probably end up in New York City one day. Do me a favor. <laughs> look up. And it was like so... Pure so and so true. Mm-hmm. Right. And it reminds you that you're a human being in the world, that you're not just like a, 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 an avatar or a, an emailer. You're like in this place with people, and they're different from you, and we live in like the greatest city in the world. And yet we've like fallen into these weird tech rabbit holes. Like we need to like get back out. So like right. get rid of the phone as much as you can. Get rid of the phone. Okay. You too. <laughs> Um, you guys met in the White House. We did. They're the best meet cute ever. In that early dating time when you were going out to dinner a lot, I assume, what would you fight about? 
Oh my God. I mean, like we. And what do you fight about now? What's been resolved and what's so gentle? Nothing has been resolved. (laughs) Nothing is. Well, you have to keep in mind, I am a member of the fourth estate, and Sam was on the inside of an administration, and there's always an attention between people on the inside and people on the outside. Right, right. And I think, in particular, in the Obama administration, I'll let you speak for yourself here, there was a feeling like, ugh, the media is like, this is some BS. Like, their criticisms around whatever, whatever, and whatever, they don't know how good they have it. Maybe Turns out right. I was right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so every, it does not make you immune from criticism, no matter how much uh, friendlier the landscape may have been towards the press. And definitely there were points where I was critical of the president and his policies on television, and Sam was not happy about that, and those conversations often filtered their way back to our dinner table, would you say? Yeah, but you know, here's, here's, I'm going to practice the one thing I've learned in the five years we've been married, which is I'm not going to say anything to this question. I'm just going to sit here and say, yeah, that's right. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not going to take the bait, because here's what's going to happen. She's going to say something. I'm going to say something. Now you're saying something. And then I'm going to, then we got to go home. And you guys are going to be, you will be having dinner at lovely restaurants throughout New York, and we will be at our dinner table, and no, I will have said something... And I'm not, I'm just not. We've gotten better and we've gotten worse. I mean, I think because when the disagreements, the, when the disagreements happen now, they're deep, like, we're, we're really they're on different. we We're on, what's that? They're less personal. They're way more ideological. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Then it was like you're in it in this, war, you know, like you're, when you're in the White House, like you are in it, right? And, uh, you know, especially when people basically agree with what you're doing, you don't really have that much, uh, tolerance for like what fe- what feels like snipes around the edges. So like compared to the big picture and compared to like what you're fighting against, right? And the political forces that are on the other side. Uh, and it, you can, you could, one could feel that maybe there's a lack of full understanding of what it's actually going on or what it's mm-hmm. like to be doing that kind of work. Uh, one could, I'm not saying I did. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's where it like gets, you know, and also it's not just like the, there's also the personal side, which, you know, it's both the like, policy part and then the personal part, uh, just, you know, my relationship with them. And so, you know, you just like... Right. Those were some intense fights. Um, <laughs> tell us, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone is going to want to know the answer to this, but um, tell us about what the Obamas ate for real. <laughs> Are you asking Alex? Yeah, I could, I could, I was could like, answer that yeah, question because I know, but you answer that question. Um, I mean, you know, there's no like secrets. Uh, Maybe you should take this New York Times opportunity to debunk the seven almonds. Oh yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, let me like pick a bone with the New York Times <laughs> while I have you all. <laughs> Is this being live streamed? I sure hope so. <laughs> Yes. Dean Beck, hey, if you're out there. <laughs> uh, yes, it is interesting how food resonates. One of the, one, I made a, so, okay. The, the context of this, who here heard about the seven almonds? Oh, everybody's heard about the seven Look at this, Look this at is it. unbelievable. Yeah. So that, the reason you think he ate seven almonds is because of something I said uh, as a joke. Basically wow. the story was, what does he do at night? What does Obama snack on it? No, the what story was about like what happens at, you know, what, what's his right. night routine? Like what happens at night? So at night what would happen was we'd have dinner. So, so while we're talking about food and politics, he had dinner with his family every night. Unless he was in California or overseas. Wow. They had dinner as a family every single night. Uh, in a way that was like totally, uh, one of the most remarkable things I've witnessed uh, is the fact that that was just sacred and even more importantly, that when he walked in, it was as if nothing else was going on in the world. Like, he was there wow. having dinner with them. And it was like Afghanistan, that hole in the bottom of the ocean, like all that stuff. The BP going, oil spill? The B, yeah, that, all that stuff that was like swirling around. And the minute he walked out of that dining room, it was like back on. But he, when he was there, he was really present. And I think that it taught me a lot watching that for all those years. Uh, then after that, we would go play three games of pool. And then he would go and read a stack of briefings like this big, literally this big, every single night. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how you don't do this job if you don't read. Like, he, how you do this job if you don't How you do this job. 
<laughs> because he literally, and it was like every page was serious, like this was not like light reading. These are like, you have three horrible choices, hear what they are, what do you want to do about something that had like lives at stake, many of them. Every memo, and every night like this. Um, I don't know how he physically did that. And so the right. question was like, what's his routine? Does he binge at night? No. And I said, no, he's the most disciplined human being I've ever come across. Michelle and I joked that like, if he's gonna have a snack of almonds, he'd have seven. <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> But of course, it's reported Obama eats seven almonds every night. <laughs> I walk into the gym the next morning, and he was like, dude, really? <laughs> you make me sound terrible, like I'm the total. And I was like, I didn't say it. So he went on the Today Show to correct the record, because it was getting so out of control. Savannah, Savannah brought it up, and he was like, I'm so happy you raised that. Uh, um, so what did he really eat? What did he eat? He ate very, he was very disciplined. Uh, it, was seven, was. it was seven broccoli He was. They ate, he ate, they ate very healthy. Like, but he could know. eat like one french fry. Yeah, he, he would eat like a fry or two and he could well, That's like the only person on earth. Yeah, yeah. Right. He, 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 he is remarkable, you know, in that way, yeah, remarkable. And for her, look, we were doing this giant health campaign. So, you know, she came in one day, we, did want, we got rid of the pyramid and did the plate. I don't know if you guys saw that. Yep. And she came in the kitchen and she was like, you better make sure that our plates look like this, that plate that we just announced today because I can't be back here eating some other stuff and we're telling everybody to eat off that plate. So like we ate really well. And then like on the weekends, they would have a burger or a pizza or whatever. Dessert right. was only for the weekends. Wow. And you know, they were a regular family, but it was one plate, nothing fancy, you know, fish or chicken, brown rice, a lot of mm -hmm. vegetables, lots right. of stuff from the garden, All nothing right. crazy. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions both about the Obamas and about everything else we talked about. So let's open up the floor to questions. And I want to just um, uh, say in a school marmy way, let's, um, these guys are so interesting. I know there'll be a lot of questions. Let's keep the questions to questions and not comment pre-question too much. <laughs> keep them short. Anybody? Are, are we having people go up to the mic? Yes, okay. people are oh, going oh, up to the oh. mic, yes. You have to work for these questions. <laughs> what? Oh my gosh, it's all on me. I'm, I'm so nervous. I'm the only one Don't at the mic. Don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. Um, so Sam, thank you so much. Alex, thank you so much for being here. I'm a huge fan. And I guess my question um, for you, Alex, is, or Sam, I should say, do you really know the impact, um, particularly on the lives of children that you and Michelle had with your um, healthy campaign? And if you don't, since I'm the, oh, I, I do have a partner at the mic. I just wanted to tell you that at the time that you all were in the White House, my goddaughter was six years old and she was going to a kindergarten up in Harlem. She called me on the phone in Detroit and she says, mom, that's my goddaughter, I have a problem. And I said, what's your problem? She says, none of the kids will play with me in the cafeteria. Now my goddaughter was active, she's funny, she, is, she loves playing with children. I said, why? And she said, because I can't move these apples and oranges that my mother and father keep putting in my book bag. <laughs> and they couldn't, they couldn't have like unhealthy snacks. They had to have right. fresh fruit. And I says, what are you talking about? She says, we swap fruits at the cafeteria table and nobody wants these boring apples and oranges. I need kiwi, kumquat, pomegranate, like plantains, like I gotta get some stuff. Like nobody will play with me. And I said, put your mama on the phone. Like she's gotta go over it. East Harlem, get you some fruits and vegetables that children a, are not familiar with so folks can play with you. That's, so that's good. the impact, Sam, that you had. Thank you. That's 16 amazing. years old now. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's unbelievable. She's 16 years old now. She lives in a community that has a very high rate of childhood and teen obesity. Yeah. She's 16 years old now. She's a vegetarian and she's as healthy as she can be. Amazing. And I like to think that her love for fruits and vegetables started when she was six oh, years I old. Love that. Nice. Thank you so much. Made my day. Thank you. Um, I, I take to heart what you said about having discussions about ideas and trying to play it out. My concern is what there's no uniform set of facts. Mm. And mm -hmm. so it's very difficult to, I find it difficult to have a discussion yeah. when someone has an entirely different set of facts 
than I do. And it, it makes it much more contentious and hard to yeah. come to some sort of a, a space of discussion. How do you guys handle it, and what would you suggest? You can't leave him in the foxhole, you know what I mean? Because effectively, like, that then should become the essence of the, dis the, the debate. It's just kind of like, okay, well, where are we getting our information from? Because I really do think it's like, if you are, we can't be content to leave people in the dark. And effectively, if you're getting your news from, you know, Alex Jones or the dark web, like, you're in the dark, you're in the foxhole, and we got to pull people out. And the only way they're gonna be pulled out is by their, their friends, their families, their fellow citizens. And it is frustrating as hell. But you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. I mean, you just, I just think we can't give up. I mean, this is, I, I, I think it bears reminding ourselves, we tried getting a divorce in 1860. It did not work. This is a project that involves all of us. And the only way it begins to work again is if we find some kind of language with which to talk to each other. And I think you're right, it begins with facts. And maybe the discussion begins in one place and it, it becomes obvious that you guys, someone is, is not informed about the basics, basic ins and outs, then that's where the conversation has to go. You gotta start from the ABCs. Yeah. I do think- you can do it without the steam. Well, it's yeah. just, I mean, it's like exercise. You know, it's but, like, it's, it, it's a muscle that has to be developed. But I do think you're raising like one of the parts of the problem that is really hard to solve, right? I mean, it's like, we're living in alternate realities. It's, one thing to do that is good is to spend like a couple days only getting your information from those couple sources, like, right? Only watch Fox and, a, you know, go to whatever it is. And because people are living in fundamentally different realities, like what they believe is actually happening. Like certain events to them did not happen. That are the only events we knew, we thought happened. And by the way, we're missing some stuff too and missing some perspective. But it's like, we ha I have, and I'm just speaking for myself, because like I, I'm in my own complete bubble. And it's so, it's, so facts are one part of it, but it's the whole ecosystem of information that people are living in. Their world is fundamentally different than ours now. And the more you can understand the ins and outs of that and how that information is being disseminated, what information is being disseminated, so you can start to say, okay, here's this is clearly a problem, let me show you know, where there's a big hole here or something that's been totally mm -hmm. missed, I think is a good place to start. Because right now, you like, the way this plays out, at least for me, is like somebody says to me, like, what are you talking about? You're great, like, you, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a complete idiot. And it's not because that they're like, have any less ability to, re to retain and then regurgitate information like we do. They're just retaining and regurgitating like fundamentally different information. And so like, try to take ownership of that information and find the weaknesses in it and find the, the places to counter it ahead of time, I'd say, uh, maybe can allow you to be less reactive. But, I, but like, there's no easy answer or good answer, frankly, for dealing with this problem right now. Sir. Continuing with that theme and picking up on what you were saying before about the lack of shared values, yeah. that's where I really struggle because I've tried three different ways of dealing with it. One is you get angry yeah. because you just feel like, like they're just missing something and, and they're, they're frankly stupid. Right. Uh, another is to ignore, ignore it, which is frustrating. Yeah. And the third is, to, which is I, I try to do, but it's also difficult, is you maybe point out weaknesses in your own side. Or I could be looking at this a little differently and hope that it will mm. you know, generate a response, but that doesn't seem to work either. <laughs> so I'm just left with, you know, how do you deal with that? How do you, how do you just feel well, good about it rather than just ignoring it? I mean, the other solution to lot of this is just to vote <laughs> and to well, win. Well, yeah, but you're talking about conversations with people. Yeah, I'm talking about yeah. also this change, like, like getting rid of some of this stuff, like rejecting it as a society. Part of it is organizing politically and saying this way of doing it is not going to win any longer. And like being able to run policy on like outright lies or complete distortion of facts has no place in our society. So, and right now it's been embraced. Like it's empowered because like somebody ran on a platform of that and has won. Well, but can I, I mean, I, 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 I'm all for civic engagement and, and making your voice heard at the ballot box, but at the end of the day, if Donald Trump is not elected, this kind of thinking about America and Fox News being the most popular cable network is not going away. The retreat is not going to be submission. And I think that it's important yeah. to understand that like this, this feeling of grievance that has led to 
a resurgence in white nationalism and all the rest, that's part of demographic change in America, and that is something we're going to be grappling with even after Donald Trump is out of office, right? right? So yes, everyone should vote, and yes, everybody should make their opinion heard at the ballot box, but to your point, there are going to be people, and many of us have them in our families and in our workplaces and whatever else, that still believe the things that Donald Trump believes and are given outlets and social media networks that reaffirm those beliefs. So I do think, yes, you are right, but you still have to grapple with what you're talking about. I. There is no easy answer, and it requires all of the tactics you've used. Probably humor is an effective one. It's hard to be funny about serious issues, but if you go see Donald Trump on the stump, he is really funny. Like, he is a carnival barker, mm -hmm. but he is a showman. He can read the crowd. He even has a sense of humor about himself. He does this kind of shticky thing. It's just like super, almost like Borscht Belt humor a little bit. <laughs> it's, and it's, it's magnetic. He's, I mean, that's why he has gotten, I mean, that's why, I mean, people love him. People feel, those, those rallies are like revivals. And I think a certain amount of like, there ha it's hard to figure out the, the, the sort of touch points for humor, but humor can be an effective mechanism for diffusing really tense situations. And we would do well to try and find it where it makes sense in some of these conversations. But everything else you've tried, I think, is you got to keep trying. Yeah, I've tried snarky humor. It doesn't well, support. I, I, have to, I have to tone down my humor. I have to tone down my humor. Humor at other people's expense right. is not. I mean, yeah. You'll have to calibrate that for yourself, my friend. Thank you. All right, thank you. Miss. Hi, yes, I'm Justine, and I come here today as a fan of New York Times, of food, and also as um, the co-creator of an organization called Make America Dinner Again. Nice. We, <laughs> I love that. We actually bring together, for the past three years, have brought together groups of people, typically four right-leaning and four left-leaning, to talk politics over dinner. But the main objective is to get to know each other as people first before getting into the politics. Um, and one thing that I've observed is a lot of the, over the years, is one of the biggest points of contention is, like we were talking about earlier, where people, what facts people are reading, where they're getting their news, and what they're, how that's shaping their belief systems. And so one thing that I think would be really valuable, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, is whether or not media would be more open to actually sharing what goes into reporting a story the fact, from the fact checking to the like, how you're looking for sources, and 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 just so people can better understand mm. that, so that when they're reading closely a piece of news that's going to shape their belief system, how that's happening. Mm. Um, I think that, yeah. And so I'm just curious whether or not you think there's an opportunity for that type of dialogue between media, between journalists, and the public. Well, I, so I think that you're probably probably talking more about television media than printed media, maybe? Or I, I don't know, because I think, you know, we're sitting in the New York Times building, and I think the Times is radically transparent about, well, wait a second. The Times, the Times has. Who booked well, that guy? If you're talking about understanding the machinations of what is, the Times has a, a television program called The Weekly that is literally each week, I don't know why I'm boosting this show, because in theory, it's like maybe a competitor to what I do, but anyway, it's on Hulu, and it's a weekly, each week they pick a different huge news story and do the in-depth examination in print, yeah. of yeah. how they reported that story out. There's The Fourth Estate, which is another documentary right. featuring New York Times reporters, and you see behind the scenes in the newsroom and how they're reporting out stories. I mean, I think there's a ton of interest in how journalists work these days, and so I think the, the, you know, the after effect of that is there's more transparency about how stories are reported. The dirty secret is television news, which is driven by, I mean, cable news is driven by ratings. And we call it news because the focus is news and information, but I mean, there's a reason you don't see a lot of climate news on television, and it's because it doesn't quote unquote rate. Like that is problem. I mean, when you have a profit driven, you know, center at the heart of the way people are getting information, that is, I mean, I think fundamentally deeply problematic, but the way, that's the way we've structured our, 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 you know, television news consumption. And there's so much commentary. I mean, more yes, than, you but know. Yes, but I mean, imagine if, I mean, if, if, the, if the news was driven by the size and the scope of the problem at hand, we would not be talking about the things that we talk about on the news. We would right. be, the, the, the palette would look radically different. Right. Um, and the conversations would be different. Right. Okay, we have time for one more 
I think two more questions if we go really quickly. Hi. Sam, I love your book. Alex, we love you on CBS. Thank you. So, Upper West Side, two children. That's a pretty inclusive area. How, speaking of your children and uh, PTA upcoming, I was a PTA president on the <laughs> East Side, though. Um, how are you, how are you going to navigate all that with your strong opinions, your strong backgrounds? It may be easy on the Upper West Side, but what if you take your children to Cleveland or... Or Long Island, where my Long dad Island. was Long Island. I mean, like, it isn't that inclusive. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not at all. Yeah. You mean, the question is just how do you navigate... How are you going to navigate... Help them to navigate those yeah, kind of conversations. your children. Right, because everybody just doesn't look like you, Sam. Yeah, for sure. I, I, no, uh, they sure don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thank God. My kids included. Uh, <laughs> should see our other son. <laughs> uh, I think for me, part of the thing that's helped me the most was travel. Yeah, uh, 100%. And I spent a lot of, I spent years and years on the road uh, going, you know, all over the place. It's like 60 something countries. And so I, for me, um, that helped shape just a fundamental different orientation to the world, to openness, to ideas, to people, to different ways of living, which has definitely informed how I think about my own country and my own place in the world and, and my responsibilities here and other people here. So for me, I think if there's one sort of broad strategy to make sure that they have the right openness uh, to the world, it's gonna be getting, making sure they're out there seeing what, what the world has to offer. Yeah, we're gonna put them in those backpacks and just take them everywhere and <laughs> That's, I mean, exposing Back, the, the, They're gonna have the backpack on them, carrying our stuff. As yeah. <laughs> All right, last one. One final. I am a history teacher in the public school in the Bronx. Nice. And we, we introduced a, well, I introduced, I convinced our principal to include an agriculture unit into the global history curriculum. Nice. We end the unit with food debates, talking about uh, like veganism, should you eat locally, should you eat organic? So. What do you think, if you're teaching agricultural unit, what do you think our young people, our students, should know about food and about agriculture? And then what kind of hmm. debates and conversations should they be having about Ooh, that's a big old question. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like I need to get this one right. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, here's the thing that, in fact, when I found, when we were moving, I found this, um, like a, uh, basically a proposal that I had written when I was like 22 or something, 20, 23 maybe around trying to start a school based on food curriculum and a restaurant and all this stuff, but basically because it teaches you history and it can teach you math and science and basically everything uh, comes up in food. So I just love what you're doing. And, but, so the first thing I'd say, the more you can connect that to other parts of the curriculum, to history, like the history of agriculture is the history of civilization, right? It's the history of technology, uh, it's transformed. Every major, basically the reason we live in cities is because of innovations in technology, like when we got a plow, half the farmers left and moved to cities, and we've seen that now throughout the, both the population has skyrocketed because we've been able to produce more, less people can produce more food, and it's all be through technological advances. So like, you start telling those stories and, and young people um, you know, can start putting these pieces together. I, I, what's the most important, I mean, I got, we should like, we'll, I'll get your information, I can't answer that on the spot, like what's the most important, curriculum matter to teach kids. I mean, I think giving kids the basic tools to understand how to feed themselves is super important. Uh, I don't, I think we have to be careful. I would caution you around like right way, wrong way, because in food we get into this like, here's this idyllic version of how you're supposed to eat and feed this way you're good and if you don't, you're bad. Um, and that's just not, one, I just don't believe that to be true. I think there's actually a pretty wide spectrum of how you can eat in a responsible way that's good for the planet and good for yourself. Um, and culturally will be interpreted in so many different ways that you have to be very careful because people can start demonizing. We, are, we, 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 we identify so deeply in who we are by what we eat. So it's, you, know, you have to tread carefully on that. Um, but I think it's the combination of understanding uh, sort of how we got to where we are, but more importantly, the implications that our food system's having on uh, our society, and particularly around our health, and on climate change, the number two driver of greenhouse gas emissions in the next 30 years or so will be the number one driver of climate change. And so I think the issues in our food system are so big going forward um, that under having a, making sure kids have a deep understanding of that so that they can live in a way that reflects their values and also maybe use it as an agent of change, 
that's what I would kind of hope for our next generation. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I just, thank you guys so much. It was amazing.